What are you doing? What are you doing? What? What are you doing? What? What are you doing? I thought we were recording Deer Tasting today. The video, not the new podcast. Oh, why didn't you tell me? I just did. Okay, smartass. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting. Today I'm going to start out talking about a chest rig system from Haley Strategic and our good friends over there. So they have sent us a expansion pack to kind of check out. This is their DC3X with some accoutrements that I'm going to go over. And what we're going to be talking about today is not only the DC3RX chest rig, but also the flat pack that they make as well as a multi-mission hanger and some cool magazine pouch inserts that I'm going to go through too. So this whole system kind of interchanges with each other. It's an expansion system, which I mentioned. So uh, the chest rig interfaces with the backpack and you know the mag pouch inserts obviously interface with the mag pouch uh, locations on the chest rig. And then the multi-mission hanger uh, is an add-on as well. So everything's kind of an add-on system. And I wanted to walk through kind of uh, my experimentation thus far was with kind of putting together uh, this rig with the things that I would normally carry. So First off, I would say that something like this, which is a smaller chest rig system, if you don't count the multi-mission hanger, this is you know, a very small chest rig uh, in, in regards to other ones that we've talked about on gear tasting before. Um, and I've got it pretty well stuffed with, with things, so it looks a lot bigger than it, than it is um, unstuffed. But this is more a system that uh, I would probably keep in a, a go bag or a vehicle or something like that uh, to have with me because when you, just to kind of show you, I'm going to remove the multi-mission hanger. And I'll go through how this actually all interfaces here in a minute. And that's actually really easy to, to manipulate and change. But, you know, when you get down to just the chest rig itself, it's easy to, you know, fold up into a, a pretty small, um, into a small space and put it in a vehicle or something like that too. So um, that's really what I wanted to advocate today is really kind of talking about the size and, and space requirements too for something like this. Um, while, you know, it's not as full featured as some chest rigs in terms of what you can carry, that's a good thing in a lot of situations too, uh, especially storing a vehicle, stuff like that. So uh, essentially what the chest rig has is along the back of it, and I'm going to remove my radio real quick. So it's got four magazine pockets along the back, just like so. And the way I had this configured is that I have my radio in the left-hand pocket, and then I've got three ex mags in the, the additional pocket. So the way that each of these pockets came configured originally when I got it was with the with basically a, a bungee pull tab like this. So I, I remove those and it's easy to basically just do this. You just untie the shock cord and take off the little bungee piece or the, the pull tab itself. Um, and then you can basically have the open pocket like this. And the magazine pouch inserts that look like this slip right down into each magazine pocket. And what that allows you to do is have a nice solid interface with, uh, with each mag, each 5.56 mag, uh, into the pocket itself. So thereby not having to really deal with retention in terms of a bungee pull tab, because I'm just not a fan of those myself, honestly. I don't like the, the bungee pull tabs. Nothing wrong with them for a lot of people, but in my, in my opinion, I don't like them. I do like it for the radio that I have in here because it keeps it nice and secured and I know that there's no secondary retention for this uh, in, unless I dummy cord it in there. So I'd be worried about it kind of falling out. But with these, it's a really solid connection. As you can see with the magazine pouch insert, it basically just fits in like that into the pouch and it's got a really nice click through. And because of the, the diameter of the pouch, it's not gonna allow the mag to fall out with this insert in it. And the back of these has a little U-shape cut out and that interfaces with the, the PALS or Molly webbing that's along with the back here. So it prevents this from falling out, basically. Um, when you're, when, if you have any resistance pulling the mag out, those little teeth kind of catch in the, the webbing in the back, if that makes sense. So that's one feature of the rig. Then moving forward on the rig, you've got four different mag pockets, just like this, that fit either, you know, this is a Glock 19 mag. 
Um, or, you know, I've got a flashlight here. And then in the fourth one, I've just got a single serving of um, Slip 2000 EWL for weapons lube. You can carry that there, which I always like having that on me anyway. And then the pockets themselves are magnetic lines, so you can't really see it too well, but those are, I believe, rare earth magnets in the back that um, keep mags in if you were using a metal mag body, which um, these do have metal in them, but the uh, you know, standard steel mags that are made for pistols would interface with those two and, and stick in a little better too. So there was also that retention you know, loop tab uh, the elastic is also on these pockets as well, and I removed that from here. You can still see the webbing that's left over. So, and then moving kind of off to the side here, it's got kind of two GP pockets. I'm um, using the one on the left for one of our EDC trauma kits. That's what I'm keeping in there. And it's got a tourniquet in it, so I like having that available. And then in the right-hand side, I've got things like a, a pencil and a notebook and some batteries and a uh, MPIL signal panel and some lock picks and things like that. Just some, some various things that I like to carry with me when I'm, when I'm out and about. And then the back of the chest rig has a completely removable panel, just like this. So that's just a loop back panel. And what that allows you to do is if you have a chest rig, should have had this out, I apologize. So an example is like the, the, the Mayflower chest rig that I have here. What that allows you to do is then interface this chest rig with something like this. So if I were to move the harness, which this is the X harness system that is new for them on the DC-3RX, that's what the X stands for. So it's an X harness system, it mounts like this, just like so. And you have the adjustment here and then the waist strap comes around. And that's the way the chest rig normally mounts. And this is the adjustment here that allows the chest rig to move up and down, basically. That's what kind of facilitates that. There's no adjustment on the actual shoulder straps themselves. And I'll get into that when we talk about the backpack. But you can adjust that there to kind of help keep that up and in the position that you like to run a chest rig at. So now I'm going to remove the waist strap. And the X harness system. Toss that to the side. And now basically what you've got is a mounting platform because of that loop that was in front. And now this can clip in just like so to the to a chest rig. So that's kind of what that facilitates is the female buckles that are mounted to the chest rig interface with the males that are left over from the, the DC-3R and it can interface like that. And you can still run the waist strap if you needed to, um, just like so. So, and another way to hook all this up, which is my preferred method, but this is great if you're running armor, so that's kind of, that's kind of the deal with the, the DC-3R is if you're running a, you know, a plate carrier like that, uh, four plates or uh, soft armor, you can interface it with that. So I like this method. And before I mount that to the backpack and show that, I want to show kind of the multi-mission hanger again. So that mounts just like so. And I like running this a little bit lower than the mounting kind of allows for. It'll make sense here in just a minute, sorry. So basically, I like running this a little lower so I can access the zipper easier. And for me, that leaves a little bit of exposed hook in the back like that. And I just have a piece of uh, 100 mile an hour tape across the back of that just to kind of secure it. I need to actually find a piece of loop Velcro to kind of stick back there to kind of protect that um, just so it doesn't eat up my apparel and things like that. So that's the multi-mission hanger. 
This is great because it actually kind of adds a little kangaroo pouch in front of the rig. And what I've been storing in there that I have configured currently, uh, I've got basically some chem lights on the front. It's got a loop panel there, and that's what I have sticking there. And then on the inside, I've got my compass and a protractor there. And then I looped one of our, our basically our survival kits and a, uh, a survival blanket in the back. And this is the MSK. And I used the straps basically to route through there and kind of secure it. So even if this thing were to flop open, it's secured. And I'm not a big fan of this reflective cord. I just have it on there because that's what was on the compass when I put this in. Um, I need to replace that with some dummy cord so I don't have this piece of reflective cordage hanging down on the bottom. But I basically just tied a figure eight on the bottom through the drainage hole. And then that way when I'm using the compass, there's, a, there's retention there and it's kind of dummy corded in. So that is the multi-mission hanger. And these inserts that you see in here real quick, these are just called multi-mission hanger inserts. And they, they're Velcro backed. One is a completely open loop like that. And then one is a, a two part sewn loop. And now I'm using one of each of those in here to, for the configuration that I have. The zipper is not wanting to cooperate sometimes with the piece of fabric that's kind of protecting it. All right, so my favorite method for mounting this, I'm gonna ditch the waist strap for just a second, is to interface with the flat pack. And so the Haley Strategic Flat Pack is something we've talked about on gear tasting before. I won't go too far into it, but basically opening these zippers not only allows you access to the pouch, but then the secondary zipper system will allow you to expand the backpack. So you can see it's got even more space now. And then the same thing with the front pocket. You can expand that as well. So now you've got a, a larger pack than you had before based on the, the, the expansion zipper. So put that together real quick. And I'll show you, due to the shoulder strap configuration, all you have to do is undo these like this. And I've already got this sized so that when I hook this into the chest rig, now I can come around with these straps and go to the waist strap. and clip in the chest rig. Now, this is kind of the configuration I like because, you know, as I talked about before with the X harness, the, what you've got with the adjustment on the shoulder strap system is these are fixed points. So the, the front of the chest strap is, or shoulder strap is a fixed point and the back is the, the adjustment. So that's what actually pulls it up higher on your chest. I like this configuration because I can actually adjust these straps from the back here and actually raise the whole thing up if I need to. And I don't find that there's, there is a reason to run this strap, but I really, I really like running it without it so far. Um, it does include in the, uh, in the flat pack, there are these loops which you can girth hitch onto. I'll take this off to show you. So you can girth hitch that loop just like so, onto this accessory loop right there. So you would girth hitch it just like these are there. And then that would give you a, a third point of contact on each side for another, another option there. Um, however, you know, with the weight that I'm carrying in a, in a lighter weight chest rig, I don't really think that's necessary in, in the way that I've been running it. And granted, I haven't done a whole lot with it other than just get it in and configure it. So that's what gear tasting is about, is kind of showing you what we're up to and currently evaluating. Therefore, that's what I'm kind of doing so far with this. Um, 
haven't had much experience with it out onto the range yet. Obviously it looks brand new because I haven't even rolled around the dirt with it yet. So this is kind of my first interpretation of it and kind of how I've been configuring it. But the other thing I like too is that when I slip the radio into this pocket, I really love these elastic loops, just like so, that I can route the, um, the antenna lead from and through there. Um, you can see those, those aren't really available on the X harness system, so I, that's another reason I, I like running the backpack more too, because then there's just versatility too. Um, the flat pack is so small that, I mean, there's almost nothing on your back if you don't run anything in it. So honestly, in my opinion, I like this configuration a lot better. Um, so that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of the system. I think I kind of talked through everything that there was. Obviously, I'm still kind of kicking everything around, but I wanted to show you how I had it configured and just walk you through the DC3, DC3RX and uh, the expansion system. Hey guys, welcome to Questions Over Coffee. The first question is from Chris T on Twitter, who asks, any recommendations for classes and resources on the use of the trauma gear you sell? EMT training didn't cover these. Yeah, if you're looking for training on the specific items in like the trauma kits that we sell or just looking to kind of increase your tactical medicine knowledge, I would highly encourage you to check out our friend Caleb Causey at Lone Star Medics. And I will put a link in the resources below to that as well as to his upcoming I got this written down, Lone Star Medics Field and Tactical Medicine Conference. Um, our guy Eric is actually going to be there teaching a class during that conference. So it's a two-day conference here in the Dallas area. It's uh, June 24th and 25th if you're interested. Um, there'll be a link to that below too. So yeah, the, the relationship to, of medical training to firearms training in kind of the tactical industry that we're in, uh, there's a severe lack of the recognition that medical training should get. Um, and I'm a big proponent of pushing that and I love what Caleb does over there at Lone Star Medic, so definitely give him uh, a shout if you're looking for something like that. He travels and as well as teaches locally here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So, hope that answers your question. All right, next question comes from Morgan M on Facebook. Brian, when shooting long range, what are advantages, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a Horus reticle like the H59 versus a more basic mill dot reticle like the H2CMR. Thanks for all you do at ITS. Absolutely. You're welcome, Morgan. Thanks for the question. Um, so while I've been getting into long range shooting and precision stuff for, I guess it's coming on two years now, um, I have still not done much with the Horus reticle other than kind of look through it on a friend's spotting scope that he had. Um, I think the Horus is busy, that's my opinion, but I also don't know a whole lot about it. So definitely don't discount it. I would suggest you do your own research on those pros and cons. Um, I'm still learning about it, so I can't give you a, a super educated discussion on the, the pros and cons of a Horus reticle. I do think it's definitely got some usage. So uh, just to briefly describe Horus, so if you're looking at a normal crosshair reticle, uh, you know, which is the normal mill dot reticle that uh, I forgot her name already, Morgan mentions. So, you know, you've got something like this, and if you're doing holds in precision shooting, you know, you're, you're holding that reticle, but if you, if you have holds that you're also holding for wind at the same time you're holding for elevation, that kind of puts you, let's just say, you know, you're holding, and it puts you in this general quadrant of, of the reticle as you're looking at it, and I know that's backwards for you guys at home, but if my hold's down here, it's just kind of an ambiguous, intersection uh, of both the X and Y axis or the elevation and windage is when I'm holding both of those, you know, I'm somewhere in here and I've kind of got to, I've kind of got to look at where I'm holding along this axis of my mill dot reticle and then along this axis and kind of just make this imaginary dot right here of where I'm going to be holding. The Horus is great because if you look at the Horus, if that same X axis, which represents your windage, it kind of Christmas trees out underneath that um, that axis, so it gives you specific points to hold at uh, for your diff diff or different elevation and windage hold. So that's my general kind of take on it and my knowledge so far. And if I'm off, please you know leave a comment and let me know kind of more about the Horus and let everyone else know in the comments if you got some some pointers on that because I just don't have a whole lot of experience for it. 
of it, but I still wanted to kind of roughly answer the question and kind of point you in the right direction. And I will try to find a good resource on the Horus Reticle too. Um, Precision Rifle Blog is a, a website I really like a lot. They have a lot of really good articles, so I'm hoping there'll be something there, and I'll try to link that below in the resources. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Sorry I didn't fully answer your question, but hope it helps. All right, so this next question is probably one of the funniest that we've ever read come in, and uh, it comes from Ernesto over email. It says, hey, Brian, I've always admired how great your complexion looks, so smooth and blemish-free which is surprising since with all the courses and events you participate in, you often go days without showering. Do you wear a lot of makeup in your videos? Uh, please share some details on field hygiene and personal upkeep uh, you recommend during events like Mammoth. Uh, fortunately, we don't have a, a, a fluffer that comes by and puts makeup on me or anything like that. Um, this is my natural complexion. It comes from genes. I guess I have good genetics. I don't know what it is, man. Um, honestly, my dad's almost 70 and probably doesn't look a day over 45, so uh, I've, I've always been kind of blessed with a baby face. Um, I probably don't look 37, but I am 37, so uh, like I said, it's just jeans. I really don't do anything more than like wash my face at night before I go to bed and in the morning and take a shower and things like that. Um, I do use, um, if I had to say a product that I use, of course, I don't have any right here to talk about. This is my hygiene box. I pulled it out just for this question. Um, man, I can't even remember. I'll, I'll put a link to the stuff that I use on my hands all the time, and sometimes when my face gets real dry, I'll put it on my face too. But other than just kind of like a uh, stuff to, to moisturize my hands, there's really nothing beyond that. No makeup. What you see is what you get on, uh, on your tasting. Um, so your other questions had to do with field hygiene. I'd rather focus there because I think that's an important topic that I, that I definitely want to discuss. And it's one I kind of got a little bit into on the Mammoth event I participated in, but this is just a kind of a generic discussion that goes for anything, whether you're, you're out in the woods for a few days or whether you're camping or uh, backpacking, like lightweight backpacking or attending an event. So Mammoth was interesting because I had to incorporate a lot of aspects of lightweight backpacking at the same time I was carrying super heavy stuff like a gun and things like that. So um, my hygiene kit got down to something like this. So it was very small um, and the majority of the bulk of this is basically a rag that I took with me, basically something like this that's cut down. This was from like a pack towel, actually this one right here, it's like an MSR pack towel and I cut it down into this and then I cut it down even smaller and put a piece into here too um, just as a way to kind of have something to dry off if I was washing my face and this actual bottle was in here too and this is stuff I swear by it's called wilderness wash I like it a lot it's from sea to summit and this is what I use kind of uh, to wash my hands over the years I've started I've used different things like I started with uh, Dr. Bronner's which is that peppermint soap that Castile stuff um, I used to carry it in a bottle like that um, for backpacking. I've always tried to repackage too because my, my DOP kit or my hygiene kit has gotten smaller and smaller as the years have gone on. And I've realized I don't need all the stuff I used to take. So uh, it's always been an evolution. Uh, I've usually, you know, at one point I was taking, you know, a toothbrush you could fold up, which I don't even think is in here. And now I'm just cutting a toothbrush that you get free from the dentist when you go visit for your checkup. So that's what I'm carrying. And then my deodorant has progressed from, you know, the small travel size deodorant down to basically putting it into a, I'll just pull this stuff out real quick, putting it into a container like this that I can just pop the lid on and open up and apply it like that. So it's really just been kind of an effort to reduce size and weight of, of my DOP kit or my hygiene kit. Um, and like I was saying, the, the Dr. Bronner stuff, people advocate this is not only soap to clean, but stuff to brush your teeth with. And there's all kinds of, there's like 50 million different things that you can do with Castile soap. Um, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. I thought that there was a list of those things on here, but maybe I'm wrong. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'll... It, you can look it up. There's like a billion things that you can use uh, Dr. Bronner's for, but I don't like it as an actual soap. I, it just bothers me. I, I've tried to use it as toothpaste and I can't stand the taste of it, so 
I axed that a long time ago and went with this and I actually carry a, a small thing, a, a toothpaste with me too, which I used up when I went to Mammoth, so I don't have one right here. Um, but I've also looked into these things. These are Sea to Summit uh, little leaflets that you can use. This is soap in a, like a leaf form and you can put water on your hands and basically get soap out of these things. I've, had, I've used, tried to use these before and they're kind of a hot mess when you're camping and stuff like that too. I don't prefer them over just a drop of actual soap. So, um, and then I always, you know, I've, you know, you progress from camping with a whole roll of toilet paper, then you get down to something like this and then you start going, well, I don't need that much over the time. I can get it down to this. And then you just start carrying wipes or something like that too. And, and that's what I did. I carried hand sanitizer and wipes in, in a plastic bag like this too. So, um, it really is just, a how much you want to deal with and what you can get away with personally uh, when it comes to hygiene. But I thought it was kind of a cool to talk, topic to talk about. If you guys have other questions relating that, I'd be happy to field specific things. Uh, but I did kind of want to address the overarching kind of shrinking of my DOP kit over the years. All right, guys, the last thing I wanted to talk about today is basically an amalgamation of gear tasting that is now in podcast form. So we have started gear tasting radio. I'm pretty excited about it. It gives me a way to not be so long-winded on the videos and talk about stuff in an actual podcast setting. So it's basically Rob and I discussing different topics and gear. Uh, we Our elevator pitch is that it's a discussion of the, the philosophy and the usage uh, behind the equipment in our lives. So, you know, we talk about gear um, a lot on the podcast, or sorry, on a lot on the YouTube series. Um, and different things and what we're up to and currently evaluating. And this is a way for us to kind of get more in depth with uh, the actual gear and philosophy behind some of this stuff. So that's kind of what I try to do with ITS in the beginning when I started it back in 2009. Um, there wasn't a lot of discussion as far as like the skill that went into why you would need the certain gear that you have. So that's kind of, you know, gear tasting is talking about the specific gear, but ITS as a whole was started to kind of introduce people to the skill sets that you, that are required behind like using the cool guy kit and stuff like that too. So we try to talk about that aspect of it on gear tasting radio too. And you know, that obviously requires a little bit more long windedness and I won't, I will spare you guys that a little, I try to spare you guys that on gear tasting. A lot of you guys have commented that you like the longer form sometimes that we get into on the gear tasting videos, but I always feel bad when I'm sitting here rambling on and you guys are struggling through watching it at home or whatever. Uh, but anyway, we started that. It's on iTunes. Uh, check it out. We just released the first episode this week. Uh, it's going to be a recurring podcast every week on Tuesday. So that's kind of what we're switching to. Many of you guys have uh, previously seen that we had a Not of the Week every Tuesday. We are now going to switch to kind of a gear tasting radio every Tuesday as a podcast format. But what we're also doing, and you might have seen this already, is that uh, we've got a video recording of us recording the uh, podcast. So uh, we're going to put that up on YouTube too. So you'll see those videos every Tuesday pop up um, and you can either listen to the podcast in a video form of us actually talking through it as we're recording it uh, or you can download it in, or subscribe on iTunes and things like that too. So uh, if you are interested in checking it out, it's Gear Tasting Radio, check it out on iTunes. Would love it if you guys could subscribe to that and give us a little uh, review on there. If you like what we're doing, let us know what you think of the podcast. And thanks again. Hey guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. Real quick, I wanted to also mention that we have an EDC giveaway. We have like $250 in ITS EDC goods that we're giving away in honor of the podcast launching this week, the Gear Tasting Radio podcast. So check out the link in the description below uh, if you want to get entered to win potentially that uh, big prize pack. And then as always, use the pound tag Gear Tasting on any social media network if you guys got questions and we will get them answered here on Gear Tasting or now in the new Gear Tasting Radio format, we can get them answered there too and I can not be so long winded. Anyway, get them answered there. If you like what we're doing here on Gear Tasting and you like listening to me talk and things like that every week, uh, please consider joining the Crew Leader membership linked below and uh, allow us to give you back something in return. Thanks for watching.